Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 183 of Korea Podcast. And our today's guest is Mr. Darwin Sellis. He's a digital artist from Las Vegas, United States. Now, with that quick introduction out of the way, let me just quickly mention that in the captions, you can find his Instagram ID, the link to his art station for more arts art related if you want to see more of his artworks and also the link to his twitter as well if you want to follow him there and you know uh catch up with his stuff there as well you know you can do so and with that quick introduction out of the way let's jump into the first signature question of the podcast which is give us a little introduction on how we got into the world of visual arts and design like basically tell us the story of that moment that made you realize that oh i want to become an artist you know Oh wow, well, yeah, that's 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 certainly a heavy one. Um, first off, I want to say I, I love how you intro the show. Uh, I, I like how you say episode one eighty third. That that's very Thank unique. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. So yeah, no, uh, you know, I'm kind of you know your stereotypical uh, born, uh, you know, born with it artist. It's like I I just loved it from the beginning. I think I started you know uh, messing around with art and. I was like ages ago. I think probably it was like you know eight five or six. You know, and I was always doodling and messing around and. Uh, you know, not knowing what I was doing, you know, in, in any capacity, but I knew that, you know, it's something I enjoyed. I think that I got a little bit of it from, you know, my father. He was definitely big into illustration and uh, and things like that. And, you know, as tech started sort of, you know, coming online and computers started becoming a thing. Um, well, I say computers started becoming a thing because, you know, I was born in 1979. Uh, and I was kind of, I kind of grew up with computers, like since, you know, since I was very little, I've, I've, I've always been around them. I've always interacted with them. So, you know, I got into Photoshop super early. I got into, you know, really crappy apps, you know, I mean, I remember using Microsoft image composer, if anybody out there knows what the hell that is. Um, so yeah, it, basically anything I could get my hands on. Um, and then, yeah, I went to, uh, AI, it's, which is art Institute, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. And. I guess that was sort of the first like official like hey like let's make this thing serious, and then from there it kind of just went off like like job after job it's always been art related, um, and then yeah I mean now I guess I'm in my my forties and I don't see uh, I don't see stopping anytime soon so. All right, awesome to hear, and well here's the thing. Um, I kind of mentioned that, you know, in the introduction that, of course, you, I introduced you as a digital artist, but I mean, as you know, it's a pretty broad term. Now, what I want to ask you is like, you know, what exactly do you like, what is your basically a specialty, you know, uh, is kind of, you know, falls on, you know, in terms of like, you know, discipline, like are you a concept artist, are you an environment artist, are you, or are you a generalist, you know, because I, I think you're a generalist because based off, you know, the stuff I see from you and, but I want to hear it from you, your own your own voice, you know? Hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I would agree that I think at this point, I'm probably more of a generalist because like, you know, concept art is, is such a specific thing, you know, like you really have to take a piece through its all its stages, right? You have to, you know, sketch it out and you have to really think about every detail. And it, it's just a very, uh, you know, labor intensive process. And I, you know, I, 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 I'm definitely not there yet. I mean, maybe it's something I, I could do in the future, but uh, as it stands sort of with my current uh, art, I really just kind of go with the flow and just kind of let the art sort of make itself, if that makes sense. Like, um, you know, I don't really sketch out stuff ahead of time and go, okay, that's it. That's the thing that I want. And then I'm going to, you know, uh, sort of run towards that. I kind of just make a thing and I'll tweak the lighting and go, you know, is, you know, can this be something? Yes or no. And then, That'll sort of dictate what you know where I go with it. So I, I guess I'm kind of sort of all over the map when it comes to that. So uh, yeah, I definitely would say digital artist for now, or I guess digital artist slash generalist is the best way to to to, to frame it at this stage. You know, possibly could grow into something more, but um, I really sort of started doing this whole thing around the pandemic because you know I, I mean I, I do have a day job, but this. Uh, starting blender and starting you know 3d code and all that stuff just really started in earnest i would say three three and a half years ago so i'm really sort of you know new into this sort of really diving deep into this aspect of things but i mean it uh, yes i mean technically i guess you could say that you're pretty new to all of this but i mean it's from your pieces that's on your instagram and our session it shows that you know how much of that you know background experience has really uh, helped you, you know, throughout the way, you know, even though, as you say, you started pretty early. 
I mean, I mean, for someone who, you know, as you're saying, like I started relatively like, you know, early, but by early, I mean, God, I think I'm missing up words. Ah, I'm an idiot. Sorry. By early, I mean, like, you know, as you said, like three years ago, like pretty, pretty, I guess it would be late now, not early. Am I right? Or am I missing it? You know? Oh, oh you're saying like, uh, what, when you be, sort of began, like when you started your career or what? No, you, you, because you said you started Blender in three and a half oh, years. Oh, right, right. So I guess sort of bring more clarity to that. So I, uh, I was an artist, you know, at, at a very young age, but I was sort of not taking it as seriously as I maybe could have. Like, because like what happens is when you have a day job, you kind of settle, you settle into things, right? And you sort of stop. Well, for me anyway, I kind of got lazy and I stopped exploring a little bit and I kind of said, okay, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to come home and I'm going to kind of be done. Um, and I think what was great about you know, probably the only great thing about COVID is was that it kind of kicked me in the ass. And I was like, hey, let's just really try to get out, get in there and get my hands dirty with things like Blender and just really learn this stuff and really sort of like dig out the ideas that have been in my head for ages and start kind of, you know, making uh, pieces out of it. Because I've got all this like pent, these pent up ideas and things that have sort of been, you know, marinating in my head for god like 30 plus years so it kind of only made sense just to you know um really kind of just stop being lazy and get serious and really kind of get into it and then you know once you start hopping on art station and things like that and you see the just amazing amount of uh stuff that people are making you're like god man like i just i want to just run after that as fast as i can and I want to get to that level. And it, I, I'm not there yet. Like, I still have a ways to go. Because, um, you know, I'm like, some ways I think of myself as kind of a, a hack. Like, I just hack stuff together until it works, which, you know, I, I guess that works for now, but I'll probably have to get a little more serious about it in the future. All right. And, but still, I mean, what, what I meant to say that by my previous statement that, you know, of course, like that boatload of experience of like, you know, developing this taste of like, you know, things you want to make, like, because you, had, you said you had this like, you know, concoction of ideas inside your brain for years, but then you, you started like, you know, getting, getting to learn Blender in 2020, then it started with that. And I think, you know, those type of experiences and tastes and like those um, knowledge of visual library really helped, helped you, I think, you know, because in comparison to someone who, who's a student and just recently starts, and uh, speaking of, you know, your works as well, um, of course, you know, there's some of them I want to specifically ask you questions about. But another important uh, topic that I also need to ask you is, how does your design process usually go into time you want to start working on a new piece, basically? What does the structure of your pipeline looks like? Yeah, like, what steps do you take, like, from the ideation level to the finished piece, you know? Mm. Yeah, no, that's definitely a good question. Um so I would say uh, I do it sort of the opposite of the way you're supposed to do it, which is kind of a, a, a detriment, but it kind of works in some ways. So I what I <clears throat> what I found really fun is I like to like, just really dive into the software and start like just clicking buttons and moving stuff and pushing and pulling. Um, that's sort of where I have the most fun. And I think uh, for me, like I'll just sort of have just a just a general idea in my head, like, oh, I'm going to have a kind of like a, a vague sci-fi piece or like a fantasy piece and i'll start kind of like building an asset or two and i'll go okay this is interesting like i like this like asset that i've made how can i turn this into something so it's the completely like wrong way to do it it's totally like you know bass backwards or ass backwards however you want to say it uh i you know what I need to start doing and what I'm doing now actually I'm trying to get better at is really just sit down and pre-plan my stuff because um, yeah, you really shouldn't make a piece from like a single asset and work backwards. So like I'll make, you know, I'll make like an orb or like a door frame or uh, I don't know, like a spaceship. I'm like, okay, that's cool. What can, you know, let's do something with this. And then I'll actually build a scene around it. And then I'll kind of work towards the composition later as opposed to sooner. Um, which, you know, probably people out there like screaming at me, like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, why are you doing that? Um, but yeah, so that's just kind of been me poking around and just sort of like, you know, uh, messing around in the dark, just seeing what this thing could possibly be. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's been my my uh, my sort of MO for, for a while here. And I've been trying to really kick myself in the butt, like, all right, start collecting references, start pre-planning. And like, you know, I'm getting better at it, but, you know, I've just been so sort of... Uh, uh, stubborn because you know like, like i said in the beginning i have so much fun just getting in there and just grabbing stuff that 
you know, I don't want to have to do that first part, which is, you know, anybody listening, please do that. <laughs> please, please start with a plan because it'll, it'll just make your pieces that much better. All right. And, oh God, like this is actually one of my favorite questions, which is what was the first art job paycheck you ever got? Like basically what was the first paycheck you ever like money you made out of art like what was your first experience of that like what was it for and how did you feel like at the time when you got it like what's the story behind it you know yeah oh that's that's really fun yeah um i was yeah i was i was much younger i think i was probably in my late 20s or early 30s and well actually not that's not true i before that after i graduated from the art institute i had a, a, a close buddy who uh, got me hooked up with a job uh, at this uh, aerospace um, uh, company in Arizona, and uh, you know, we we didn't do many uh, very many exciting projects. It was just you know very like boilerplate graphic design stuff, just to sort of get um, ideas out there. But you know, it was nice just to be that young and to start, you know, going from working at you know video stores and pizza places to jumping into your first, you know, actual like you know art job. So that was that was great. Um, but I think the first time where I was really like, wow, this can actually be something is I think I was like unemployed or I was, you know, doing some work for my father or something. And I sort of got this uh, freelance gig and doing doing uh, logos because that's kind of where I initially started. My career was like graphic design. Um, so I did a lot of logos and I did a lot of just, you know, um, like sort of graphic stuff. And uh, I had done a bunch of work for this person. And I wasn't seeing any money. And I was like, wow, I'm doing a lot of work for this guy. And I wonder if he's, you know, scamming me or whatever. And he was really nice, nice dude. But uh, eventually I was like, so, hey, like, you know, uh, are you going to eventually pay me for this? He's, and he hands me, you know, what did he do? He started writing a check. I'm like, well, wait a minute. We haven't even discussed this. How do you know how much I want? And he goes, how's the thousand dollar sound? And I went, oh, I, that, that shut me up right away. I was like, uh, I, that sounds amazing. Like, you kidding me? I'll, I'll take a thousand bucks for, you know, whatever, a couple logos or whatever I did. And, you know, me being, you know, whatever, half the age I am now, I was like, well, sh fuck, man, like a thousand bucks. This is insane. Like, you know, what what, uh, what am I even going to do with this? So I kind of even went back to my family and my dad. I was like, well, I just got paid for doing a couple, you know, some logos. And I was like, all right, this is this is pretty awesome. So that kind of took off from there. Wow, that's actually an interesting answer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's in, it's it's weird because uh, not weird. I mean, interesting in a way because you know mo most people artists that I've had on the podcast, you know, a lot of them started with like graphic design or um, like I, I had like few cases of people who started first with front end development. Like basically, that main incentive is money. Then they get to mm -hmm. it. Then they realize that oh, it's not that glamorous. The lifestyle is not that glamorous. But because the Though the type of people that say that say that those are usually the artists that want to make those cool concepts they have in their mind, you know, like mm, absolutely. The, the, don't get me wrong, like graphic design and like you know, front end development and UI design, all that stuff are great, like you know. But it's like, all right, I actually made this analogy before on the podcast. It's like you know, imagine carpentry, all right, and making MDF cabinets is for me is like graphic design and like front end dev, but making sculptures out of wood or you know, unique handmade chess pieces out of wood is like the arts that we like to do that we usually do you know the concept art you know the 3d art and illustration stuff that we do you know you know i think that's an analogy i usually use and i think that kind of fits the bill what do you think about that uh oh you mean like sort of what what you sort of did or oh you mean like just building stuff as art is that sound sort of the question yeah yeah, yeah. it's basically because the horizon of the expanse you have um as a digital artist like these days is so vast and the oh, amount sure. of creativity you have in your hands is amazing you can do everything but i mean at first you know of course like two of the main things i mean not right now anymore by the way like compared to a couple of years ago but graphic design used to be so hot in the early of the last decade like 2012 13 14 the web development this stuff like in terms of like art careers like especially like, like in my country and i and i'm sure in i and i even remember in america and just you know europe like websites like 99 design and like there was a bunch of other freelancing websites they were so popular and a lot of people that got to it of course i mean it's it's money and nothing wrong with that but mm -hmm. 
a lot of those people are true artists at heart. They want to like express themselves through art. They don't want to like necessarily like you know to get someone's idea and do their uh, logo with you know fifteen after post production edits. <laughs> it's then, yeah, totally. Yeah. It's no, like I, a, I, I, I totally, I totally understand what, what you're getting at. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, but I mean. Uh, and, it, and like you say, I do love it. And the only reason I do it most days is just because I want to do it. And when I sort of jump into the program, you know, like before I started getting paid, it's, I would just, I would do this every day regardless. Right. So if somebody were to like send me a message and be like, Hey, I want you to make something for me. It's like, I mean, great. You know, why not? I mean, I'm going to do this anyway for free. So, you know, why not do this, you know, and, and get paid for it. Um, you know why not? But like, yeah. As far as what you were saying earlier, I mean, yeah. Anything, anything you sort of uh, can sort of dream up and you and you think is art and you want to be art definitely can be. I mean, you know, from like you said, building something to you know taking pictures to you know painting whatever it may be. Um, yeah, just, I guess you just gotta you know do it because you love it. I mean, you know, now look at all the all the mess. We're, not not mess. Like like look look where we're at with you know NFTs and. And, and and the digital space and and all that stuff it's just uh it's wild and not to mention i oh got ai and you know i mean that's a whole nother can of worms right yeah definitely like there's so many like fun things happening right now and we're living at such a cool age and um all right so we've reached the section of the podcast which is called general art chat which you know as a you know mentioned previously is basically we just talk about different stuff right now of course there's going to be like more questions after this but yeah there's some like random miscellaneous stuff that i'd like to put it for this section um sounds so, good but like actually i also mentioned like before we start recording like you know actually last you're actually the first guest i have from las vegas and it's actually <laughs> a basis of one of my favorite games of all time which of course you know i told you before we started is fallout in vegas Mm-hmm. And yeah. speaking of Fallout, I don't know if you saw the news from Todd Howard and Bethesda. Did you hear about the their timeline of like you know their big projects, like you know what are they developing now, what they're gonna do next? I have, yeah. I mean, and I I hate to say this, but I'm gonna break your heart a little bit. Uh, I kind of ah, I kind of think Bethesda is a little bit overrated. I mean, I know that they are completely worshipped, you know, up and down. People like think Skyrim is basically like you know is is Jesus on a cracker you know whatever they love this stuff and and I know you absolutely love uh, New Vegas and I know people who just settle into one game for their whole life and they don't touch any other games and I did I think we mentioned as well I did play Fallout Three back in the day and it was it was enjoyable enough but man I tell you these guys they need to get a new engine they need to uh, you know get a lot of the jank out of their games a lot of the, the weird you know stuff i mean to me it's you know i i don't take anything away from the people who like bethesda or their games i think that you know if you appreciate it and you love it that's amazing you know and if that gives you emotional uh, you know satisfaction or whatever that's cool but to me like i kind of fell off with bethesda just i think fallout 4 was the last one i dabbled in it's like wow they're really just singing the same song you know year after year game after game I mean that it may be a little cynical of me, but I saw uh, Starfield, and I was like, "Wow, this this not only is this not a new engine, but it's it's kind of just like Fallout in space, right?" I mean, is that how you feel? Yeah, kind of. Like, here's the thing: you made some really interesting points, you know, in the stuff you said. And yes, like, trust me, like, you know, Bethesda needs to. I mean, you. I mean, the prime example is Fallout 76. It was a huge disaster, and there was there actually recently, you know, a lot of reports came reports came that you know, the staff were under crunch, heavy crunch, like you know, periods, and it was a it was a whole mess of a project. But here's the thing, like you know, of course, for actually, like here's a fun thing. Do you know why like New Vegas, New Vegas is different than other Bethesda games? Because it, it was outsourced by another studio called Obsidian. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's the main reason people sort of cite in fall of vegas is that you know it's exactly. in fact yeah it got handled by somebody else which is why it was so much better and they did it in like one year and six months nine months something it was less than two years they did the whole game they were on yeah. the college L- mm-hmm. listen and this isn't biased like i'm like i swear this isn't biased i know it sounds like bias as hell. but the writing in new vegas is on uh, like another game that i've seen that matched the level of writing in new vegas was disco elysium i don't know if you heard or played that game 
I, writing, yeah, I, yeah, for sure. I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. The writing in those games is just like, it's actually like good literature. It's good stories. It's like you're reading a nice, really good, intriguing book, but you're playing it, which is makes awesomeness double, you know? And oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. listen, I played the game first time when I was 12, Fallout New Vegas, mm. and I still play it to this day. I'm 25 right now. <laughs> And, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Look, I, I mean, I I feel for you, man. I I, I know people who play Diablo three exclusively. Like, you know, that game came out. Oh, how many? You know, lifetime. I think. Yeah, like lifetimes ago. Like, right? Like, you know. And it's like, hey guys, you know, there's uh, other games coming out. They're like, oh, that's great. That's cool, man. Okay, I'm gonna be over here playing Diablo three, like season one thousand four hundred and seventy. It's like. All right, man. Like whatever. Like if, they, if that's what you want, that's cool. So, so that's what you're like with with New Vegas, huh? No, not exactly like that. I mean, I play new games as well from time to time. But um, here's the thing: even with New Vegas, as I played this amount of time, I still I still find new stuff in the game. Like I swear, I'm not kidding. And <laughs> like, like I'm not kidding. New events, new items, new quests. Like and like it's amazing. New like. One of the things, even with Fallout 4, listen, Fallout 4, I played it. And it, like before I used to play it, it didn't get me so much a couple of years ago. But now with an open mind, I came back to it. Yes, there are some repetitive uh, things in it. But in general, it's a, in terms of gameplay, they managed to upgrade upgrade it a lot. Like it's, it has a really good, fun gameplay and like gun mechanics and gunfight. It is it is actually a fun fighting game. They added mm-hmm. settlements and modifications to armor. All those stuff are great new assets to the game, and I really enjoy it. But none of those, like, not even... Like, here's the thing. Not Fallout 3, not Fallout 4 don't have the same magic that New Vegas or the Fallout 2 or 1 had, you know? Mm-hmm, and, right. But Fallout 3, it had, like, a DLC that blew my mind in writing as well, the pit DLC of Fallout 3. Mm-hmm, yeah. It, the writing was just mind-boggling to me like i know maybe i i'm not the best person to critique to writing because i know that i'm self aware that i don't have a huge database of like writing material in my head to compare to but f- from my own like limited experience like that dlc like the pit dlc and the fallen new vegas in general like the thing with fallen new vegas is all the dlcs are interconnected and are additions to the main story of the whole setting you know absolutely which, yeah which is yeah. amazing like just <laughs> yeah Yes, sir. absolutely. Yeah, no, I know. And I just would say like you, you are, that is totally amazing. Like, you know, certain people will just really connect with something and it will just sort of live in them and sort of, you know, just keep living, you know, basically an, an internal, like, you know, uh, lifespan. Right. So, I mean, I'm kind of the same way, you know, I played, you know, really shitty games back in the nineties uh, and, you know, oh, well, most people would, would con- uh, consider them shitty, but because of how young I was and how impressionable and, what they sort of did to me it's like you know those things are considered classics right um you know like oh my god like i play you know would play uh, like you know Noctropolis or like the longest journey uh i was a huge adventure game uh guy back in the day like you know mid to late 90s and you know not so much anymore but you know those are very formative uh, memories for me so you know they may be uh you know <laughs> like junky or, or or you know kind of uh you know whatever they may be but yeah no they 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 definitely hold a hold a warm spot in my heart as does vegas for you yeah definitely like here's the thing i i get what you mean like you know being young is always like you know because your taste and experience is fresh and new so the games you're going to play is going to be like your first impressions of you know certain genres like you you mentioned the thing about starfield that's going to be like you know just fall out in space boring I mean, listen. I I hope it's not going to be like that. But the thing, the reason I'm saying it like this is because I'm I'm fearful of Bethesda, to be honest, at this point. So I'm kind of afraid they might mess it up. I hope not. I hope they actually make a little fun game out of it because I don't want to have the same experience of Fallout 4 or 76 in it. I want something new and fresh as well. And I'm sure. I see. And I'm sure they have like the best people in the industry to work on this stuff, and they probably think about this stuff too. But, uh, yeah, we just have to wait and see. But the, the reason I mentioned that is because Fallout 5 is also in the plans. But first Starfield, then the next Elder Scrolls, then Fallout 5. And it's stated yeah. that it's just a one-page document by now. And people are already speculating about the setting of it. Some people say it's going to be Texas. Some people Los Angeles. Some New York, Chicago. And, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see. But the, th- the sad thing about that is, like, I calculated that 
it's going to take like 25, 30 years till we get there. Right. And I'm going to be about 50, 50 or something. <laughs> like, it's crazy when you think about it, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that, like you said about the age thing, like that might actually sort of get softened or subside a little bit as you sort of get older, you know, you're probably going to find a nice partner and you maybe, you know, sort of slow down a little bit. Like for me, I used to just be a gaming, like just monster. I would just lock myself away for untold hours and just not give a crap about anything. And now it's like, I might be able to squeeze in, you know, two hours, three hours and Either I lose interest or I'm like, all right, that's enough. I have other things that I need to do. Like, you know, I'd hop on the hop on the computer and, you know, fire up, you know, a 3D code or something and start tinkering around. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I definitely feel you. Um, the one thing about uh, Bethesda is like, I don't know. I mean, you ever heard that that phrase, you know, uh, past behavior is a good indicator of future behavior? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So basically, to me, it's like, okay, you know, you've 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 made this game 2,900 times, and it's always had the same uh, problems, and it doesn't feel good to me. Like games have to feel good. Like that's that is like number one in my book. Like, you know, things like uh, Call of Duty and stuff like that. They set the gold standard for controls and like first person stuff. And it the way I don't know what they do, what sort of magic or voodoo they have, but like the the response curves and like the, the way the dead zones work and just, you know, not to throw too many tech terms out there, but it's like, yeah, they, they, they just know how to make it feel like it's just a part of you. And when I play things like fallout, it's so robotic and so clunky. It's like, I just, I don't feel the flow there. So automatically I, I, I write it off as like, this is not an action game. This is very much a, uh, you know, slow paced RPG where you're, you know, with, you're talking to these zoomed in head faces and the, you know, they're flapping their gums and they're saying their thing. And then you move on to the next one. It's like, it's a, it's a world full of robots, even though they have skin, if that, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And, um, ah, there's so many things that point, interesting <laughs> points that we made actually. Ah, oh, God, like, I don't know. Like, here's the thing, even with, like yes uh, I, oh i was gonna say this um yes when you're young i mean it the you're impressionable as you said you know the media you consume at the time like you know it affects like your tastes in the future as well and stuff like that but here's the thing um even though that's the case and i agree with you on that and it's a like objective thing that happens with people i still you know as a gamer i used to even browse back and download like old 80s 90s games as well like you know sega genesis emulators i used to tinker with that a lot when i was a kid like you know when i was mm. like 10, 11 and i found this emulator that had like 843 like sega genesis games on it <laughs> you know so i was like a, i was like i don't know how to explain that was basically it was like crack to me like that's the best way i could <laughs> explain and oh my god how many times i hours i wasted on that emulator and there was this game i don't know if you heard about the king's bounty it's like an mm-hmm. RPG turn-based game. Have you played that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The, the old Genesis, Sega Genesis ones? I wasn't a huge Genesis person, but I have heard of King's Bounty, yeah. And the, the old game, like, you know, even though it was, like, so different than the... Like, if I showed this to any of my friends at the time, classmates, like, classmates, they would be like, what is this, like, you know, old, dusty-ass, like, you know, game? It's boring. <laughs> it's not doesn't have good graphics. That's what, like, the most casual, basic gamers would say, like... Jesus, like, why do you care? The game is fun. The gameplay is fun. The setting is cool. Like, it was literally 2D animated sprites moving on, like, a flat animation. It was so basic, but it was so fun, honestly. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we like, back in the day when we played, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Sierra catalog, but, like, King's Quest, Space Quest, uh, all that stuff. No, no, Um, Because, well, you were in two camps, like, back in the 80s and 90s, wherever. Like, you were a Sierra person... Or you were a, uh, a LucasArts person, right? LucasArts, like you know, you know Monkey Island, uh, Maniac Mansion, any of that stuff. Uh, but anyway, so I guess the moral of the story is like, uh, yeah, I mean, the stuff did not look great. But back then, you were calling your pe- your friends over, like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Like, this looks like real life. And then you look at it now, and you're like, I, what a joke! Like, who was I kidding? This is not at all real life. But yeah, when you're in it, you feel it, which is which is which is good and yeah i haven't really played those games but um 
but yeah, but that's kind of what I meant by you, you sort of yeah. taking a trip, a trip back to the Sega stuff. It's like people yeah. would, you know, like you say, they look at it and they go, what is this? And you're like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like this guy does this and he goes to this planet and he kills this guy and then he eats his brains. And they're like, oh, okay, man, whatever. But like, you get it. We get it. But they just, they don't understand. Like another game that I remember that was crazy to me. And even for his time, that this plot was so like abstractly and bizarrely, but cool was echo the dolphin do you know that game? <laughs> yeah absolutely that was a sega game right yeah it's for any for the unish, uninitiated who might not know what the game plot is about it's basically like you know if i remember correctly it's a dolphin then yeah suddenly, you're, you're you're literally a dolphin that's yeah <laughs> yeah and here it gets crazier wait um then i guess a race of aliens abduct a lot of your friends and sea creatures so you have to find them then you find this, like, you know, monster thing under the bottom of the ocean, which sends you back in time to Atlantis to mm. retrieve an item or, or learn a frequency or something. Like, because dolphins, like, communicate through, like, echolocation, hence the name of the game or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Then you come back to your own time, use that location, you get teleported back to the moon base of the aliens, fight the overlord, and get your <laughs> dolphin buddies back to Earth. Like, isn't that, like, both amazing but bizarre in a sense at the same time you know oh my god i just i can you imagine like the 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 pitch meeting for that like can you would you have the balls to go into a meeting room and then go all right uh you know what do you got for us and they're like i got this dolphin that goes to outer space and you know it's like come on i mean who who greenlit this game (laughs) i can tell you who a genius greenlit that (laughs) <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. But I mean, that's the kind of stuff, you know, we, we dig, right? Because it's so off off the map and it's so bizarre, but we, we can connect to it, which is, which is great. Yeah, and I guess I think about like repetitiveness, I mean, that's this, one of the saddest thing in game, a AAA game industry, not game industry, huge distinction. In AAA mm-hmm. game industry is that the repetition is so much. Like Far Cry was used to be one of my favorite franchises, but now it sucks. Same with Assassin's Creed. Maybe mm-hmm. that's me. I know this. It's a subjective opinion. Like you know, I know. I'm sure there will be people who's who are going to like disagree with me. But Far Cry sucks right now. I get. I get it. The art, the concept arts are good. The art direction is good. Art, art related stuff. The music, sound engineering, all that stuff, good. They're improving. Mm-hmm. But the game in general is just a basic formula that they just. Oh, it's just discussing. You know the whole thing. How AAA industry is like. You know, milk a cow to the straw. Mm-hmm. And you exactly. start playing the same game but with different characters. Yes, technically I know that's the whole point, but I don't know. Like make it some somehow make it make it difference. I don't want to feel like I'm playing Fallout Three, like a mod of Fallout Three. You know, it's like the every fa- Far Cry game. Oh, I said Fallout. Actually, I meant Far Cry. Jesus. <laughs> um, every Far Cry game after like Fallout Three is just a base. It feels like a mod of Far Cry Three. You know, it doesn't feel like a new game. Like uh, yeah, sure. I mean, some of the games like they. They try new settings. They try like different uh, specific things to the whole um, game, but it's just I don't know. It's just disgusting. The same with Call of Duty. I, I don't remember the last Call of Duty. I think it was Black Ops Two on Xbox like seven eight years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, which, for example, the zombie the zombie game modes, I love them, and I'm and I'm, and I know they still do it. Um, but in terms of innovativeness, it's we don't see it that much. Like in the yeah. game design, like a recent, actually episode 171. Oh, here's the interesting thing. For anyone who's listening, you're probably wondering like when this episode got recorded. They were recording this episode on July um, 8th, like 8th of July. But your episode is actually, this is episode 183, all right? Actually, I'm telling it to you as well. Um, your episode will be uploaded August 19th because I, there's a lot of episodes to be uploaded before that. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, of course, I will send you the links to Spotify and YouTube versions whenever it's uploaded and ready. And the thing is, like, you know, wow, it's like it's four, at least 40 days till it get uploaded. Jesus, that's crazy. But the thing is, like right now as we're recording, that's the thing I want to say. Um, I posted a teaser for episode 171 today, you know, which I which it was with Sean Woe. He's like a main, one of the, I think, art leads and senior environment concept artists on uh, ADUS Montreal, I think. If I'm not mistaken, but he worked on the recent Guardians of Galaxy video game, which a lot of people thought it was going to flop. Wow, because, yeah. Because the studio flopped the previous Avengers game, you know, which was mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. a terrible disaster. I don't know if you heard about them. I but, did, yeah. But the Guardians of Galaxy game, it's like I, I couldn't, you know, download or play it. But from the footage I've seen on YouTube and the critics and things, it's like a bomb. Like it's a great game because... 
here's the thing. They, they designed it as experience, not necessarily as a game. Like, you know, in particular, like some cutscenes, there's like a certain music is playing, like because the whole Guardians of Galaxy is just a really heavily rock music centric, not just rock music, just, you know, 80s and 90s, 80s music centric, you know? And they right, right. utilize that thing to perfection in the game. You know, you should just see that. I don't know if you watch the game or not, but if you could, you know, buy a new game and want a fresh, the art style is, by the way, great as well. Like it's, it's like a eye candy as well. So you mm. get both fun, quirky, like, you know, quirky, sarcastic dialogues, you know, the Star Lord, the Rocket, and all of them, the whole thing. Oh, yeah. I actually, I actually did play that. Um, oh, really? I, I, wanna, I think I finished it. I, it, I it, That was one of those games where I had to take screenshots from time to time because wow. some of the architecture and some of the art design in that is it blew me away. Like, it's some of the alien worlds are so bizarre and out there, and the colors that they use are just, like, eye-melting. So I definitely have a, a folder with with some screenshots from that game. I do, um, do yeah. have a, a screenshot folder as well. <laughs> yeah, no, very cool. And I think, I mean, I, I you say it was kind of a, a bomb. I, I'm not sure if it was or not, but I kind of have a theory about that game. And it's the reason why people are sort of saying, oh, it's got this great narrative and the story, yada, yada. Like Guardians 3, the movie Guardians 3, had to get, uh, held back because of, you know, there was a bunch of drama with James Gunn, the director. Um, and I, I have a theory that the story in that game is going to be the story in the third movie, or it's going to be something similar. So they really were pulling from an amazingly developed source because, you know, most video game stories are not that great, let alone um, comic book video games. So to have one that's that incredible, I mean, Look, I mean, I have, you know, maybe they, they made it on their own. I have all confidence that they totally could have done it. But I'm just saying it's very rare. So don't be surprised if you see that when Guardians 3 comes out, that the story is pretty close to what the game was. Because I think they were cribbing off of what the initial script was going to be. Anyway, oh, that's oh. my that's my lofty theory on, on Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy. Yeah, that actually kind of could make sense. But... Um... Like, I love it, like, you know, in video games, when they, for example, add a certain music, you're, I don't know, like a theme to a certain mission or a segment or sequence, it makes it memorable. And, um, like, I think one of the biggest ones that is, like, in gaming history is, like, one of the famous ones was in Far Cry 2. I don't know if you played that. Have you played that? Oh, two. That's the one where they started to get into, like, the, the malaria and, like, no, 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 that's, no. It. that's an... Uh, Far Cry oh, 2. Oh, sorry. Oh, Far Cry Three! Yeah, you know, I I actually quite I, I enjoyed Far Cry Three quite yes, a bit. Yeah, awesome. yeah, that was fresh, first time. Absolutely, and, uh, yeah. Like the scenes where you have to burn a build field of like you know wheat farm, you know, and it was just mm-hmm. like, acrylics, like you know, EDM hard style thing, like playing in the background. It was so epic, honestly. It was mm-hmm. so fun. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, they, there was kind of a golden age for those. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if it's golden age, but like that time was was pretty good. Um, and since then, you know, Ubisoft, I've lost all respect for Ubisoft. It, they're just, it's the same, you know, open world, you know, climb a tower, open the map bullshit for like the last ten years. And I, yeah, like every time they uh, show a new game, I'm like, ah, I, I could care less. I mean, and so that's yeah, that's I mean, yeah, like you said with Far Cry, it's it is the same game for i think what are they yeah they just put out six recently i'm sure they're going to do 25 more and they're going to you know make whatever money they make so it, um, more power to them but i think i'm i think i'm off yeah i'm, exactly. off, the, I'm off the ride at this point <laughs> yeah and um yeah here's the thing like even another i mentioned assassin's creed like you know in assassin's creed one in the first ever trailer of the game um, I don't know if you remember that there was basically Altair walking around trying to save someone from hanging, assassinates the Templar, then runs away and hides. That was basically yep. the whole sequence, right? Mm-hmm. At the trailer, if you remember, he used a crossbow, all right? And at the time, it was a huge controversy in the team because they were like, oh, it's historically inaccurate. So they removed crossbow from the game. It was originally supposed to be, it was supposed to be had crossbows in the game. But here's the thing. They did that, but then here we go to like, you know, Elder Scrolls, no, wow, why did I say Elder Scrolls? Jesus, my brain is lagging. <laughs> um, like, well, then we go to Assassin's Creed, the recent trilogy of Assassin's Creed, there we have fighting Medusa, the mythical creature, then, like, Norse mythology, they throw that in your face as well. Like, what is going on? Are you guys, is, as, it, as if it seems like they're going for money as much as they can now? 
Well, just, I mean that that's what that's what that's where the world is going. I mean, I you know not just not just video games. I mean, you will find you know ten times out of ten that you know the money wins every time. I mean, people in those studios, I imagine they're extremely creative, extremely hardworking, and they're busting their ass and they love it. And I totally uh, I, I respect the hell out of that. But you know, it's not unfortunately they don't make the decisions, right? So you're gonna get like you said, Medusa add-ons, or you're gonna get you know. Uh, you know, Altair baking simulator or wh- whatever, you know, is going to make, make them money, which, which is unfortunate. Yeah. The thing is, um, by the way, like when I say, you know, they're going to all anything that makes money, like, don't get me wrong. Like, of course, I mean, all the artists, the artists that, you know, work on those teams, you know, deserve all the credit and, you know, the reward they, you know, they earn. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely. But time, Absolutely. I despise it. When the balance gets like you know kind of unbroken, that they have enough money, or they try to like you know get like you know get scammy. Like for example, EA or Activision. What was it like? They're trying to involve NFTs in Call of Duty as well. Oh which, boy, which was yeah. weird. And like the microtransaction system, and like basically when you sacrifice actual good gameplay, like fun, genuine, like the authenticity of a franchise over money, that's like when like you're basically ruining the legacy of a franchise. But I mean, who who gives a shit? Because as long as, you know, the people, or work, the directors or producers get more money, you know, that doesn't matter. We're going to even kill a franchise. Ding, 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 Disney Plus, you know, and there's like <laughs> so many Star Wars and everything. Of course, I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, but I don't follow, but, I've, but I hear the cries of a Star Wars fan every time, you know, there's like a new recently um, Star Wars movie. They're like, they're basically saying they're butchering and bastardizing the whole franchise at this point. Uh, which is yeah, of course, it's yeah. not out of like you know the realm of reasoning at this point from these people, and um, yeah, I mean, I hope that doesn't happen to Fallout. Oh my god! And well, I mean, yeah, I, I hate to break it to you, but I, I think I think it already has, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, yes, I mean, I mean, yeah. like you're talking about you know creativeness and creative bankruptcy and stuff like that. I mean, the fact that you're doing like a Marvel style rollout schedule and they're saying, hey we've already planned out to, you know, 2049 in these games. It's like, all right, guys, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, hit the pause button, go in a dark room and, you know, really search your soul and be like, okay, well, what do we want to make next? You know, what do we like? But, you know, as, as we said, unfortunately, you know, when money's on the table, it's, it's hard to sort of uh, get the stuff off the ground. I mean, it, it's a fine balance, you know, you're balancing it on the tip of a sword, right? It's like, you if there's no money, there's no game, if there's no game, there's no money. So, uh, but I think, unfortunately, now the uh, the scales are unfortunately tipped in you know the wrong side. But uh, you know, it's it's it it sucks. I mean, what do you what do you do, right? But all this negative stuff aside, like I I'm still really hopeful, you know, for not just Fallout, like just no, especially I'm for Fallout, you know, because the thing with franchises that have a lot of passion and soul into them, they don't die. And what I mean by that. When you make actually a product out of passion and you put your soul in it, other people will notice it, you know, not necessarily mm-hmm. like, you know, intentionally, but unintentionally as well. Like, because it, it always shows when the quality of something, you know, if the producer or creators of them like actually put love into it and Fallout 2 and 1, New Vegas especially, are those games, you know. And just Fallout series in general, I mean, of course, they're, they, it had its own hiccups and upsides and outsides, but all, all in all, it's a pretty good setting you know fictional setting honestly to be honest and it has a lot of potential still and what i'm what i'm going to get to is this that when you do that you're going to have a huge community and audience to back you up all the time you know Mm -hmm. and that community starts to make mods the modding community of fallout just all fallout games are insane and recently they a new mod had it's a game-sized mod called fallout london it's mm-hmm. a mod of Fallout for it looks absolutely amazing. They made right. it, 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 stories and even Bethesda hired a lot of those mothers, you know? That's it, exactly. Exactly. And that's, you know, or you you know, if I were to ask you why would why do you think those modders did that in the first place? What, what would be your answer? It's, course, it's not because it's, it's, it's not because of money, right? It's because they love this 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 game and they want to get their hands in there and they want to exactly. you know, they want to make something. Exactly. So you know, if if I guess maybe I guess what I'm saying is if the the uh, the big game companies would actually take a note out of their 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 book, you know, a little bit more. Obviously, you know, you can't do it, you know, you know that much. But yeah, I think they they'd be in a much better place. Um, 
Yeah, no, mods are incredible. I mean, look at the Dark Souls community. Look at uh, oh, God, Dark Souls. No. Hell, any any of these communities. You know, these people just get in there because they're passionate about it. I mean, not just that. Even let's say not passion, but out of like you know wanting to um, get hired by Bethesda, which will happen for a lot of them. If you want to get hired by a big company, you should show great work. And great work doesn't. You can't engineer great work. I mean, yeah, technically you might say like you know you could, but trust me. You, it's not that's a ch- part of it, but at the same thing, the passion should be there. If it's not there, I mean, like, come on, you know, who are you kidding? But the thing is, like, if it fall out of London, which uh, they actually managed to get for voice actors a lot of the recent previous Doctor Who's, you know, which was super fascinating to me. They did a tremendous job on the they even the factions that was in London. Like, it was. I'm I'm super excited for it, and. Um, like yeah, even Fallout New Vegas has a lot of mods. They even right now they're trying to make Fallout One and Two in Fallout Four engine, and even New Vegas. This is the craziest things, you know. And yeah, so so I mean, you really see you, you definitely have a very strong uh, attachment to to the Fallout stuff. So what what do you think uh, sort of makes that makes that a thing for you? Like what what why does it stir so much uh, enjoyment in you? Like what about Fallout do you like? Well, um, many things, but let me see. If I try to boil it down to a simple point is it tells good stories about humans and just human intentions and characters and personalities. Mm-hmm. So basically how humans work in general. Mm-hmm. And about it says a lot about like the events and the different characters and the, especially the factions even um, tells a lot about human nature in general. And it and it's something interesting to see because it's like the the world is a clean slate now and everyone's going to start anew. And it's like the beginning of the... It's like a repeating cycle that you see like from the dawn of humankind that's been going on to the... Like even... Like that's basically in it in a nutshell, I guess. That's one of the most mm-hmm. interesting things. But when you add all the elements of like cool post-apocalyptic things, it makes it even more cool. Then you add, like, you know, it gets, things get sackpiled, but genuinely, n- not the combat or anything like that. It's just the stories to me, the writing. Um, that's really interesting to me. Yes, the writing, actually, the stories. That's the main okay. thing of all that, that really caught off, like, just attracted me to it. Yeah. And um, the thing is that even with, like, you know, Fallout London getting rolled out right now, um, another thing I want to mention is that, like, let me just quickly mention another franchise. Sure. Grand Theft Auto, all right? Beloved franchise, all right? <laughs> yeah. What was the, when was the last fall, Grand Theft Auto came out? 2013, all right? I was in sure. high school, all right? And, uh, oh my God, it's been so long. And um, from then till now, n- not even rumors has, like, of course, rumors are there, but I don't think it, the next Grand Theft Auto is in development. Maybe I hope it is, but... Like, the thing I want to say is, Grand Theft Auto V, great game, don't get me wrong. Like, all the Grand Theft Autos were great games, actually, now that I think about it. But, like, when you have, like, even the old games, especially, it had, it just like with Fallout and a lot of games from that era, it was made with passion and love, you know? Mm. Because, because the game industry was a baby at that time. Not a complete baby. Let's say it was a teenager, you know? Sure. And, um... It was young, so if anyone got into gaming game development, they, it was passion mostly because they knew the money wouldn't be that much of a high, you know. Most people, and internet wasn't you know that because today you know it couldn't the indie game scene was pretty small as well. So the people that did the games, they did it with passion. And as I mentioned, like just like with the Fallout point, when you do that, you get the community, and when you get a passion community, you get a lot of mothers. They want to keep refreshing the experience with new. Addition, so they can just just keep playing the same drug. You get get those of <laughs> the game they like. And, oh my god! Like I saw this Unreal Engine remade GTA, like remasters of like GTA Y City, San Andreas, and Three. I was like, oh my, this is so awesome! Yeah, yeah. And yes, but for example, like honestly, do you think like I don't know. Call of Duty Modern Warfare, like, I don't know, 3 gets that same treatment in 20 years? No. Definitely not. No, of course not. I mean, because, like, you know, as much as I praised uh, Call of Duty's controls, I mean, they they are, you know, copy-paste, you know, just 
you know, monotonous military, you know, screaming at each other stuff. Like I, I have not played one of those in ages either, but I, I, I see what you're getting at. I mean, it, the game does have to have a heart and it's got to have a soul that can live on, you know, to make it viable to do something like that in the future. Like, you know, you're not remaking, uh, you know, you know, whatever it is uh, that the, uh, like you said, the 19th call of duty game, like it's just not necessary because they're going to already have one of those out, you know, anyway, like you don't need to remake, although they have remade some call of duties, but yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, uh, especially with all the new stuff they're doing in unreal, like they're putting all kinds of things in a new unreal because that just took off, you know, when they put, came out with uh, uh, version five, and, you know, all the new tech that they got thrown under the hood in there, you know, why not, you know, like with the Matrix uh, demo that they put out with, uh, you know, all these new experiments that they're doing, I think it looks great. I mean, presentation goes a long way. You can have a pretty uh, boilerplate uh, experience, but if the presentation, for me at least, like I am a presentation a horror for lack of a better term like you know being an artist like i if a game is like old school like oh it's oh it's pixel art and it's like it's this indie game it's like i it just doesn't do it for me like i need you know well i don't need but i i love bleeding edge graphics and i love a presentation and that to me is is really important so yeah no i, I think uh you know everything we're saying you know with gta and remakes and stuff it, it's very exciting it's just you know you, you do have to have the the guts to uh yeah, you know, the exactly. core the, the emotional core to make it uh make it viable yeah don't get me wrong like you know presentation is important for me as well but the thing is mentioned about like these generic indie games like they try to add like pixel art things to make it pop like as a nostalgia factor for it like it all feels so forced honestly oh my god that's the first that's the first thing i see like when i see that i'm immediately i'm, I'm clicking off like don't give yeah. me this d make you know hash blah 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 like i mean that's great i am not a um i'm not a multiple time you know game player that like, people will play games over and over and they'll go back to games 10 15 20 30 years ago and like i can do that for 10 minutes and i'm like all right i'm good you know let you know i'm i i remember now <laughs> and then and that's it for me like and i cannot just i can't stew or in that in that uh, nostalgia that long yeah exactly and um yeah but of course sometimes you get gems in in the games as well like there's a, there's a lot of them like you know that there's so much that i can't even it's weird when your brain gets frozen when you know a lot of things but none of the names come to your mind you know i'm mm-hmm. kind of at that point now but um yeah like the like the recent indie games actually that i played that i had a lot of fun which the game was super simple like i don't think you played it but human fall flat was one of them it was a super fun multiplayer game mm-hmm. yeah and uh, i don't know if you but did you play that uh i've seen uh people play it i watch a lot of twitch so like uh you know when, when i have games that i don't necessarily have time to play or want to play yeah, i'll exactly. just watch I'll, I'll just watch somebody else play it like while i'm doing something else like okay i get it you know i i watched uh, a lot of people play human fall flat and that just looks like a uh, f- uh fall guys esque like you know body physics yeah, type game yeah yeah yes yeah 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 exactly but it was so like amazingly fun when i played with my other two friends like it, it was so chaotic and fun like <laughs> and... well that instantly makes any game better like when you play with friends like you could it could be the shittiest yeah, exactly. game in the world like yeah oh, we yeah. i i played the there there was this like just ungodly shitty south park game that came out i think it was for, like xbox 360 a sick of truth like, no, this is way earlier than that. It was like a oh. flat 2D like side scrolling thing. It was garbage, but get two or three friends in there and you know, you you're you're taking they've got this thing where you can like uh like duck down and you can like make this like pumping motion. So, so somebody went to the bathroom and uh we were still playing the game and I I come up to his his avatar cuz it's motionless cuz he's not playing anymore. And I'm just doing this like crouching move and it, it looks like I'm like humping the character and he has no idea what's going on. But like everybody else in the chat room is just like busting up laughing and they're having a fucking just ball of a time. And and that's, that's all it takes, right? It, it's just a couple of friends and you know, you're off to the races, man. It, it's, it's a blast. Yeah, exactly. Like, but uh, yeah, I mean, especially recently, the whole industry has been gearing towards multiplayer games, which is fine. I, I don't care, but like, like the whole thing about experiencing a, uh, new story through like single player games like it where it could be like click and point adventure games where it be i don't know like you know rpgs like fallout skyrim or something 
But that mm-hmm. kind of genre of gaming is kind of slowly, I hope it doesn't, but it's slowly like getting shifted away. I don't know, like, but it's kind of p- pity, I think, in my opinion. But, like, mm-hmm. I, I don't necessarily like, you know, I played like Battle Royale games, you know, a lot, like Apex Legends, um, some PUBG Mobile, but I don't know, it's just. It's just weird. Like you collect <laughs> items for like thirty minutes to die, two seconds to a fucking ten year old who plays the game for fourteen hours a day. So- oh my god! Yeah, no, you nailed it. I mean, and I think that's the problem with it is that there's definitely an age range for the sort of thing. I mean, look at your average Fortnite player or whatever. There, you know, between like I don't know, nine and like thirteen or whatever, whatever the age is. It's like that's their jam because that's you know, they're in like you like you say they're in the formative years and. This is the stuff that's going to, you know, graft it onto their brain and they're going to, you know, remember. I, I mean, which is, I mean, it's, it is great, but it's also kind of sad. It's like, you know, 20, 30 years from now, they're going to be talking to somebody and go, man, games used to be awesome back in the day. Remember Fortnite? And it's like, wow. It's, you know, it's, it's one of the things about getting older. But yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, there's, you know, you know, you know, people like what they like and you kind of can't really knock them for it, but it, so games like that are definitely, you know, you, you get aged out at a certain point for sure. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think the whole multiplayer craze is is a thing. Maybe that's not necessarily for us. Um, yeah. You know, I, I would have I would have been all about it, you know, uh, ten years ago. But you know, br- I bring on a, a just a very well authored, creative single player experience. I'm I'm there for that, man, for sure. Yeah, definitely the same. And all right, here's an interesting question that I had, which is because, you know, based off a lot of your works, you know, they, here's the thing. All right. I'm, I'm just going to say the question. All right. Have mm-hmm. you ever used your dreams as inspirations for your works? Uh, I would say yes to, to a certain degree. I mean, I will take bits and pieces from my dreams sometimes. And I, I actually do want to do that more. Um, unfortunately, you know, you do lose a lot of the details when, when, you know, as soon as you wake up, right, you kind of lose a lot of what you, you know, uh, what you wanted to, what, what wanted to do. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely try as much as I can. Uh, if I, if I can hold on to the details, I will try to put some of that into, uh, into my work for sure. Yeah. Um, but for me nowadays, most of it just comes from, you know, uh, like intuition and things that I've kind of grew up with, you know, like I said, I mean, uh, growing up in the eighties and watching all those really terrible action movies and, and anime and uh, not that anime's terrible, but um, you know, that stuff sort of influences me more and current artists work influences me more than, than dreams not nowadays. Yeah. And um, all right, here's the thing. Now I want to ask you about some of your, you know, like certain aspects of you know some of your works and one of the things that caught my was like there was this post uh you named it the title is arid block all right Mm -hmm. and of course someone asked so cool you also use kit bash or it's everything modeled by you and you reply to him or her i don't know thanks i modeled everything using wireframes and gribble add-on and here's the thing um there was i even saw like this i don't remember the name of the person but there's this amazing gribble add-on that just generates like um this different like you know randomly generates these patterns of like you know hard surface you know mechanical sci-fi stuff on Mm -hmm. the surface of the faces of a mesh and i was wondering are you using the same thing because it looks really cool honestly uh oh no thank i appreciate it thank you uh it's I, I think it, honestly, I'm not using that one. I had downloaded that one. I, I followed that guy on Twitter. Um, I think his name's like something De La Cruz or something like that. Uh, I forget what the name of the add-on is, but you know, I've sort of since uh, been using a lot less add-ons just because they're such a pain in the butt to migrate from version to version of, of Blender. Because like, because when I was first starting, I was like, okay, yeah, bring on all the add-ons. You know, they, you know, I love it because uh, it's so easy to just sort of like you know get a one-click solution. But I think I ended up using what did I use? It was a it was a combination of hand modeling, just sort of doing like random extrusions, uh, you know, on on a shape. It was sort of half that and half this other uh, plugin that I think some other guy put out. I forget what his what his name was, but uh, it it wasn't that one that's that's making the rounds now. There's a really popular one that's that's going around now, but it was it wasn't that one for sure. And then, you know, I think I, I finished it off with some materials that used like a edge detect 
because uh, I mean, you don't really see a lot of that detail, but you know, I, I like to get some edge detection on my geometry, just get a little bit, little bit of that worn, uh, let that worn look and stuff. But yeah, I mean, uh, that and you know, wireframe, wireframe in Blender is incredible, and it adds a lot of detail for for you know, not you know, free geometry, but you know, it's uh, you just it's kind of a great little one-click solution. And from what I've gathered from like a lot of your posts, you mostly the main tool of these are Blender, but I'll, but I've also seen like you said you also use 3D Code as well. I have two questions. First, mm -hmm. let me know on what parts that Blender likes that you have to use 3D Code, and what and what parts does 3D Code you know excels in comparison to Blender. First, let's go with this question, then I'll ask my second question later. Yeah. Okay. So Blender. You know, Blender sort of being the first one that I really got my 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 toes into. I mean, I had you know dabbled with 3D Max and Maya back in the day, and I didn't get too deep into those. But because um, I, I had actually tried Blender like a couple of years ago, and I absolutely hated it. I mean, you know, being a Maya person, uh, you know, I was got so used to the, the the fly controls and the orbiting and and stuff like that that you know you hop into Blender and you're like this is just some weird alien contraption. Like why put this key here and why use that? I was like, screw this. This is lame. Um, but then when I actually started getting into it for real, I really came to appreciate, you know, the workflow and, and how you can sort of fly around, uh, uh, you know, your, your 3d space. Now it's like second nature. I just, I don't even think about it. I'm just, you know, I'm in there and I'm doing stuff. Um, Blender is great for really uh, sort of just, Getting in there and getting your hands on the model and 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 uh, extruding and pushing and pulling stuff and it just feels comfortable and setting up scenes, setting up lights, getting sort of your environment all sort of laid out how you want it and you know and atmospherics and fog and all so it's just so much easier just to get sort of all the kids in the pool if that makes sense um, and with things like 3D Coat I that's a very singular. Uh, um, software application you know, like I just sort of build like organic assets and um, and sometimes non-organic assets but it just feels so good to cut away on an object or sculpt an object uh, just the, the tools that they provided are just really cool it, it, it's it's really entertaining and it's as sometimes I used to tell my my art friends I love blender but I almost almost like 3d code more because I just have how fun it is to use. So what I'll do now with 3D Code is I will build an asset, you know, retopologize it, uh, and paint it in all in 3D Code. And I will say I'll, I'll go to the file menu and I'll say, okay, spit this out to Blender. And from then, I will construct a scene. I will set up cameras. I will set up atmospherics, and I'll get all my you know renders and stuff. So I, I don't really use um, 3D Code for setting up scenes. I just don't think it's built for that. And I don't, I don't know if it can handle that. I'm sure some people are, I've seen some uh, damn wizards in, in 3D code. Um, and I'm not as well versed in 3D code as I am in Blender. So that's basically the gist of it. Blender is, is sort of the the big papa, the Photoshop, the, the workhorse. And 3D code is more of like, hey, let's build some cool assets and get some really cool yeah. materials on there. All right. And yeah, actually, my second question is kind of related to materials and textures as well. Do you do all the lighting and texturing and everything in Blender as well? Or do you use like, I don't know, something like Substance Painter? Nope. Um, I dabbled with Substance a little bit and I found it a little bit hard to use because I, I really don't have that much experience with it. So if it's a, let's see, I do like doing materials quite a bit in 3D Coat because it, it is kind of so easy. I mean, it kind of really does all the hard work for you. Even if you're in the preview window and you're sculpting something and you just slap on one of those like preview textures, I'm like, wow, that already looks amazing. You know, let alone uh, spitting it out to retopologize and putting it going in the, into the paint room and really getting in dirty with the details and really like, you know, okay, here's where the dust is going to collect and here's where the, where the shadows are going to be and the highlights and being able to just set that so quickly and easily is, I love it. So, uh, you know, not that I don't. Um, do materials in Blender, but I just I think uh, 3D code is just so intuitive and so fun. All right, interesting. So you kind of you basically you take you do texturing in 3D code as well, right? 
Uh, for sure, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, like I said, I'm not as well versed in 3D code. Um, I'm kind of relatively new to it, but uh, from from what I do know, I, I I do have a good time with the. I mean, I just find the painting and the and the topology stuff so intuitive. Like I can just click one button, and I'll have this you know uh, model that's you know three four million polys, and it'll crush it down to like something as low as fifty thousand. And when the normal map activates in Blender it looks incredible and you would not know that this is such a low poly uh, object. Uh, so that's just, that's oh, what I love nice. about it. So when I'm doing like metal stuff for like organic stuff, I'll, I'll immediately go to 3d code first, as opposed to just, you know, box modeling and blender. Cause it's just, it's such a, it's a, it's a little bit of a slower process. Interesting. And like, for example, that your piece called desert Atlas, I really, that's my actually favorite piece of yours. Actually this one, Oh, cool. I really yeah, love yeah. Desert Outpost, and it looks really cool. So you did the texturing of that in 3D codes, I assume? You know what? If if I recall, I think that's 100% Blender. I don't think I did any 3D wow. code with that one. That is – I kind of cheated a little bit. So, I, uh, you know, everybody loves uh, JS Placement. I don't know. You know JS Placement? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah. I it, It's been getting, you know, overused uh, these days. But it's just a great way to get, you know – a lot of really cool gritty like sci-fi detail so i'll just put like you know a js placement texture on a on a flat plane and i'll texture it with like a grungy texture and i'll basically just like replicate that uh you know uh, over and over again until i kind of get a cool uh look to it and what and when you put it in cycles which is a uh, a rendering engine in blender which is really accurate and does really good shadows um you just get this kind of really nice gritty just like abstract thing that you know doesn't really cost you a lot of uh you know brain power because you're like all right it, it all the work's kind of done already so you know i'll bend stuff and i'll i'll tweak stuff like you know the big um there's like this big flourish on top of the main building this like almost like seashell looking thing that's just like you know uh random geometry and uh and js placement and you know and uh, shape modifiers and stuff and then, yeah, you just like throw in, a, you know, a main sun source light and some other auxiliary lights and you're off to the races, man. And, you know, I do on that one, I think I did a bit more overpainting after the fact in Photoshop because I kind of want it to be a little more painterly, like a like, little more dusty, a little more dirty than than I had gotten out of the render. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. And so from what I'm seeing, you must be super good at using nodes in the, the shader, either of like, you know, the blender. Because the textures look pretty cool. Yeah, and that, that's the thing about it, right? It's like I am not the biggest like material guy. Like, like you know, uh, one of my good uh, art friends, uh, Max Hay. I don't know if you're familiar with his stuff, um, Max H A Y. But he is like uh, a material like genius. I mean, like what's on display in his work more than anything are the materials. And I'm I'm so lazy. Like I think about materials last, like if ever. For me, it's just about the lighting and, and the shapes. And if I need materials, I will go ahead and I'll, I'll like tweak that later in Photoshop. Like I'll overlay some some photographs um, or I'll sort of integrate photographs in, in some way. But yeah, I really, I don't think about materials as much as I, as much as I should probably in, in the beginning. <laughs> so like, I mean, it's just like, for example, like on a lot of my like sci-fi building scenes, I mean, there's really, there's no materials on there. Like if anything, there's like some roughness map and maybe like just like a very basic metal. But um, when it's so dark and it's so moody, you kind of really don't notice. So I don't really do a lot of material work on those. All right. And I was wondering how long did it took to render actually? That, that's my main, one of my main questions. You know, when I get, a scene and it's really heavy on, on on the geometry like you know back in the day when i was first starting and i kind of wasn't aware of what i was doing i'd get scenes that were 10 12 million uh, or more uh polys in a scene and i'd be rendering in cycles which is like okay this is probably going to take you know 20 30 45 minutes sometimes just to do a single frame um, which is all I really want. I'm just making, you know, flat art. I'm not doing animations, you know, you know, fucking heaven forbid I try to do an animation with, you know, an hour per frame. But um, now I'm really learning that you really need to keep your scene as light as possible. Um, uh, one of my uh, heroes, you know, Ian Hubert, that's really all he does is he just makes his scenes as low poly and lightweight as possible. 
And that way you can just cram in as just much stuff as, as you can at the scene and not make your computer explode, right? So uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do lately is I'm really trying to just, um, cause I mean, really at the end of the day, 3D is 2D, right? You're just sort of taking a snapshot of this. You know, just because it's 3D doesn't mean you're really gonna sell it as 3D. Uh, so I guess for me, geo or geometry is not as important because there's other ways to sell shapes, uh, I guess at, at the end of the day. All right. And yeah, amazing stuff, man. By the way, like the Herald of Tinel one is also in Blender as well, right? Yep. That was one of the ones where I just kind of was just messing around. And it was funny about that one is, uh, I, I hijacked a, another model that I, I, it's actually a, like a weird, like alien, like boat that I had made and for a previous scene that didn't end up working out. So I was kind of just messing around one day and I was like, you know what, what if I just start adding some mirror modifiers to this? And I started kind of like mashing it together with itself pretty much. I'm like, what can I get out of this? And then I'll, you know, I'll throw a light on it and I'll go, is this working? Like, is, is there, is something happening here? And I go, okay, it's something's kind of working. So that's all, basically all it is. It's just, I took this old boat thing that I'd made and I kind of smashed it together and I, and, you know, I threw some lights in there and it, it ended up working. Um, for the most part. But yeah, that's just me goofing off, like not having a plan and just kind of like, all right, you know, what, what is this thing? I don't know. I have no idea what it is, but it kind of looks like a, you know, like an alien spaceship or like a hive uh, spaceship from Destiny. I don't know if you're familiar with Destiny, but it's that kind of a hive-esque feel to it. Mm, but yeah, but yeah, it is all Blender and that is all, uh, all the materials are in Blender, yeah. Actually, that kind of reminds me of the mothership of like the Federation from like, you know, Firefly series. Have you watched them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Firefly, uh, Serenity. I used to watch this stuff all the time back in the day. Yeah. That's like, listen, one of my favorite genres ever. Like one of them is like post-apocalyptic, but not the necessarily the dark, grimy, depressed post-apocalyptic, the fun, happy, solar punk, uh, the good ending type of so post-apocalyptic, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I would put Guardians of the Galaxy there. I would put, uh, you like, well, it's not as sci-fi Western as like Firefly is, but yeah, it's like, you know, you got this sort of like uh, plucky, like swashbuckling, like rogue type character, you know, and he's kind of like a wise cracking dude, right? And he's he's got his guns and he's got his he's got his he's homies and he's, you know, they're having fun in space. I mean, that's 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 a great genre for sure. Yeah, I'm not just I, I wasn't the type of I, I didn't really mean Guardians of the Galaxy per se, but, you know, that's a good genre as well. But. Uh, what I want to say is Western sci-fi. That's my favorite type of sci-fi. Like Fall on Vegas is literally that. So oh, Firefly, for sure, absolutely. Firefly is that Cowboy Bebop is that? Like I, I, oh yeah, I'm a sucker for that genre. Honestly, like it's. I think I don't know. It's one of the like the principles of like design is like the con. Uh, one of the pillar foundational pillars of like the whole concept of design is contrast. Sometimes you can utilize contrast in subjects to. Um, make a design cool. Like, for example, one of the most famous of that is like a steampunk. It's a famous like uh, genre in art where you have two contrasting subjects mesh together to make a new thing. Mm. Another one is cyberpunk, which is super like popular. And mm. the thing that I think is a bit is still underrated to this to this day is Western sci-fi. Like in terms of like writing and the settings and being able to implement the stories in that type of thing. I love it because here's a thing. Humans are not going to change even in a thousand years if the earth, if the civilization hasn't collapsed, you know? Right. We're still going to get the same, like, archetypes and characters and personalities. Like, you think, you know, even if you go back to 400, 500 years, yes, things are going to be a lot different. But the core personalities are, I think, the same. It's just the equipment and the environment is different. So I think the thing that it is really, I think, you know, relatable for me in those genres like western sci-fi is that they keep that piece of like humanity intact in them they don't try to like bullshit you with you know oh it's the future in the year like 2700 and humans are like this and that They're like no humans are not going to change that much let, let me be real with you you know <laughs> and yeah i guess that's my subjective opinion but I'm, and i'm sure people are going to have like differing opinions but yeah that's the thing. No, I, I think I think you absolutely nailed it. I mean, that's that's sort of what makes good storytelling, right? Is I mean, no matter what set dressing you put on a thing, uh, it's only going to be as good as you know the you know the heart of the story and and the, and the human characters. So, 
you know, I think like when I think of like uh, my Minority Report, you know, that Tom Cruise movie, uh, that Steven Spielberg movie, it's like, yes, the the set dressing and the window dressing is sci-fi, but at the at the heart of it is just it's a very human story, and you know, with with you know, human uh, you know archetypes and human values, and that's at the end of the day what makes it resonate with you. It's not you know, pew pew laser guns and spaceships. I mean, that's extremely cool. And it's, it makes your eyes and your brain very happy. But, you know, like you say, you know, the, the human part is what really makes it last. Yeah. And, um, oh God, like I love this subject. We've been talking about video games a lot. Like I could talk about video games honestly for 10 hours, like in a nonstop. And say, yeah, you should be, you should make a, a, a video game podcast. <laughs> No, I'm kind of like, you know, like, here's the thing. I'm kind of cheating the system because instead of like making video game podcasts, I just, just talk about video games on my art podcast, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, no, hey, that, that, that's, that's great to me. I, mean, I, I deal in all these sort of realms. I love it. I love, you know, how, um, <clears throat> I love how games talk to art and how art talks to games and exactly. movies and stories. I mean, that really think about it. Video games is everything we love about, you know, they all rolled into one. You know, you've got stories, you've got music, you've got you know, uh, interactivity, uh, art, it's just all slammed together in the same, same thing. So yeah, I think if you don't like video games, you're, you're, you're missing out on something. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, definitely. And here's the thing. If one day, I, I don't know, like, uh, I'm sorry, it's a personal question, but do you have kids? Uh, nope, I don't have kids. Uh, well, I, I say that I have kids, but I, I have, uh, <laughs> I have six cats that they're, they're my children. Oh, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. But here's the thing. Like, I want to say, like, if one day I make, I get the opportunity to actually find, like, form a family and have kids one day, I hundred percent like this. I'm not kidding. One of, I would make make my kids if they want to play games. I would definitely like you know introduce them to RPG games of like whether it be Skyrim or Fallout games or anything that's relatively in the same genre but new, because as a twelve year old kid, honestly. First of all, it's improved my English a lot, all right? So, like, because I'm from Iran originally. I'm not, I, I don't know, a lot of people have this misconception because I have, like, American accent. I'm, I don't know, <laughs> I've been born in America or just outside of Iran, but the, I'm, I haven't set foot in an English-speaking country ever in my life. It's just, wow. out, it's just out of me, the games and music and internet and all of that, honestly. <laughs> That's awesome. That's and, awesome, yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, um, first, it, and here's the thing, it's a, really fascinating medium to learn about stories and learn about different like archetypes of characters and it's it's like i don't know how to explain it. it's just it's good life experience i think the way i would put it you know in a good oh, way yeah, yeah. game honestly like yeah, absolutely i mean like, you, you're not alone i mean a lot of people use you know movies and television and, and games books. Yeah, exa- oh, exactly. Yeah. And they use that as a gateway to, you know, to not only entertain themselves, but yeah, they learn, uh, you know, different cultures, different languages. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, great. I mean, there's no reason what not to do that. I mean, why, why jump into a, you know, a boring, you know, app or a book that's going to try to tell you to speak a language that just seems like the wrong way to do it. You know what? The more I look at the Desert Outpost piece, the more I like it. I actually, after this recording, I'm going to share it on the stories of the podcast. Which it, that's that's a really cool thing. Like, honestly, I really like it. Awesome, man. Yeah. So, and I think one thing about that one too is I I do I use Daz from time to time. Uh, it's a you know it's like a humanoid. Um, uh, what do you call it? You, you can make like you know characters. Um, oh, so right. so if you, if you see uh, characters, and I want to say like I don't know, probably ninety percent of my pieces, it's it's usually Daz, and um, I try to keep it pretty simple, right? Just so, like you see in the Desert Outpost scene, there's like crowds of people and and like little you know figures kind of walking around. A lot of those are like overpainted Daz figures, or and some of them they're actually photographs. I'll like you know get photographs of like crowds, and I'll just stick them in there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy that one. That one, that one's interesting. You know, I, I, I do like. I've always sort of enjoyed desert uh, type scenes. I mean, even when I played old video Same. games, like honestly, I love deserts for some reason. Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, I, I, I mean, I grew up in the desert, which I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But um, like, even like, like I played uh, Zeno Gears back in the day, like, and I always loved when you because you know they've got like different like hub towns, right? You've got your your tropical town and your lava town, but it's like I always gravitated towards the the sandy desert town. I just liked them. I don't know why that was just me. So, like, if if you see like you know desert uh, being a theme in my work, that's 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 probably why. Yeah, and 
God damn, I, I think we're on the same boat on this. Because I'm the same. <laughs> I love desert environments. I love, I think it's mostly because of Fallout New Vegas, honestly, to be honest. That's the main culprit. Oh, okay. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, because I, whenever you say Fallout, I, just, oh, I picture, what was the last, wasn't three like uh, Boston or Washington or something? But you're right. Like, uh, you, but yeah, no, you're totally right. Vegas, desert. I mean, that makes total sense. Yeah, exactly. And like, listen, if I one day come to Las Vegas, I'm going to be that idiot running around trying to find the same landmarks that was that were modeled in Fallout New Vegas and trying to make. Oh things. my! God. I know. It. Like, that's so funny you say that because, like, you know, when you see like stuff in a movie or games, you're like, oh, New York, you know, blah blah blah, and it's it's so great and grandiose. But you know, if you haven't if you haven't been there, there's a certain I don't know. There's like a fantastical element to it. You're like, oh, wh- wh- where is this far off place? It's like all you got to do is you know hop on a plane and go there, but um yeah like when places uh or rather when uh yeah like video game environments take place like in a place where you're at it's it's a little it's interesting because it's like wow like i literally can just go there like right now and touch that landmark uh it's yeah it, it, it's, it's bizarre very bizarre wait and there's even like a little town called good springs near las vegas is that true i had never heard of good springs that might be a fictional <laughs> it might be a fictional thing uh, i no, i don't know that. Because I saw, I think it's a gas station, like that small level of Good Springs. But it's actually because I think I saw photos and videos of Good Springs and there was a plaque outside of it that says, and it said, yes, this is the Good Spring that was, you know, inspired by that New Vegas got inspiration from. So like the huh. places like Prim, Novak and stuff like that, I think they're based in, if I'm not mistaken, real life places. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, you know, they gotta obviously be careful with that stuff. You can't just say, oh, like, because you know, we we have chains and and branches out here. I don't think legally they could use that stuff. But I mean, oh, I'm yeah. not. There very well could be a Good Springs. I just, I'm not familiar with that name. I mean, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you know a lot of the big time stuff is definitely here. Like if you you know go to the Strip or you look at the Las Vegas sign or uh, hell, even you know some other some of the other cities. You know, they're they're probably all here and they're probably represented somewhat in the game. Oh god! Like I, in my head, I just I'm just imagining going to different places in New Vegas, and I'm just having a smile on my face. I don't know. This game, like, listen, I'm going to be 90 years old in like some sort of like you know, um, retirement home or something. I'm, I'm, <laughs> anyway, I, I swear, like I'm not even kidding, you know. And I sure I'm still finding new stuff in the game as well. <laughs> and yeah, this- that, that to me is incredible. Like the fact that you can still find new stuff. I mean, I don't even. How old is that game? Is it like late 2000s? 2010, like, I think. Yeah. Oh wow, 2010. So yeah, I mean, if you're still finding stuff now, then shit. I mean, you might as well be finding new stuff when you're 90. I mean, why not, right? Yeah. And uh, but here's the thing that I genuinely love about like Bethesda. One of the one of the positive points. And it, which is the amount of dialogues, especially for Fallout 4, they like hit it. Like it was amazing. The amount of dialogues that is in that game for every single possible, like, you know, outcome and things. And whether if you have a, like in the same outcome, if you have like for every company you have there, you're going to have a unique dialogue. There's so many dialogues in that game. I'm amazed. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Oh, I mean, oh. it, I, I, and for all the, you know, the, the sort of, you know, crap I get Bethesda. I mean, the one thing that they can definitely focus on is things like that, like dialogue, because the way sort of they make or they build their their games is they're kind of setting up dominoes, right? They're like, okay, we're going to just build all this stuff and we're going to put it in this sandbox and we're going to press play and it's all just going to go, right? These these characters and these environments are going to do what they're going to do and, you know, regardless of whether we like it or not. And so basically, you know, they just set up a bunch of like automatons and they, you know, so instead of like a very, um, I guess, uh, authored, you know, very like intentional uh, game, they say, all right, we're just going to build this stuff. We're going to wind it up. We're going to wind up the wind up toy and we're going to just let it go on its own path. That sort of, I, I imagine that frees them up to really focus on other things like the writing, like you know, uh, some world building and stuff. So yeah, that's definitely, that's cool, man. If, if that's something that you, you gravitate towards, I, I think that's totally awesome. I mean, I, I, for me, I just wish that the, the presentation was, was there more because we you know when, when, when these, you know, uh, low poly, you know, actors are, you know, on a locked off camera and they're just talking at you and like, it just, the, the lines don't ring as true to me if, if they were to be, you know, a little more, uh, you know, intentionally designed, I guess. 
All but right. yeah, man, they they, they definitely uh, you know they they do a great job for sure on some of the writing. All right, awesome. And um, all right, who are some of your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most? Wow. Um, I mean, uh, some of the some of the heavy hitters nowadays, you know, like uh, you know Ash Thorpe and uh, Maciej Kuchera. Um, uh, a lot of the guys on our station are great. Uh, there's this one guy who just I remember I, I caught on to him a lot like when I first started looking at our station, and he to this day he's just incredible. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know about him. His name's like Suo Shi or I think it's like S H U O, and I think his first name is like or last name is S H I. Um, no, I don't think I know. I think you can type it in our station or but uh, just incredible like the way he merges you know photographs and and uh and 3d and stuff he, he's just he's amazing uh but yeah like even like i mean i like uh, beeple's uh, earlier works um you know i mentioned earlier my buddy uh, max hey he's got some some great work um yeah there's really too, too many too many to to list uh there's a polish artist who i think died in the 90s uh, uh let's see what's his name he does really morbid uh, oil paintings. Um, he's from Poland. What's his name? I think it's like. What? I think is his Instagram profile picture isn't his like face laughing with one of his eyes come out something like that? Because uh, that... yeah, what is it? it it's it's Sidlowski or something like that. What I, I, I oh here it is. Yeah, Beksinski. Oh no, that's not our person. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, if, if anybody is curious, I mean, it's his stuff is really morbid and really kind of out there and abstract. But uh, for how he he did it, I mean, he used to he used like I believe he was an oil painter, but um, man, just the detail and the craft that he put into this stuff just blows me away. And you know, being from I have a you know, Polish heritage. Uh, my my parents were born, you know, like in Germany and Poland and Ukraine and stuff. So that oh. just you know has another connection to me but you know a lot of those guys are, are are people i like all right and um what area besides the area you're working on right now which is of course art and design and all of that would you be interested to explore and learn in the future like basically what i mean by that aside from art what other hobbies or aspirations or things you have that you want to do in your life hmm uh, I'd say we, when I was uh, younger, or uh, maybe uh, I'm talking as maybe as early as 15, 20 years ago, I was obsessed with with film. I mean, I still am to a certain degree, um, but I wanted to be a director for the longest time. I was like, man, just the emotions and putting music to to certain moments in in, in film, just what how that made me feel. It's like I I want to do that. You know, I used to I, you know love action movies or. You know, now I've sort of grown up. I like a little more dramatic stuff, like you know, like you know, David Fincher movies and uh, things of that nature. Um, yeah, th that that's what I I was for sure. I'm like, I'm gonna do this. Like, I want to be a director. You know, and I would, you know, I would get the camera with my my buddies when I was a kid, and we used to run around and we used to make stupid little little action movies. You know, they were complete garbage, but uh, you know, I I just wanted to do it so bad. Um, I mean, nowadays, you know, it's it seems like quite the mountain to to overcome i mean making movies it just seems like the hardest thing in the world but i think now i'm i don't know i'm pretty happy with what i'm doing i uh, i think art is is amazing and it, regardless of what i'm doing every day i'm looking at art station and i'm looking at you know instagram and i'm just i'm trying to you know get in, inspired and i'm trying to you know find you know in, new guys to follow and i think uh i think this is definitely what i'm going to be doing for for the foreseeable future for sure all right, pretty interesting. And well, we've reached the final question and section of the podcast, which is called Final Words. And let me explain what that means. Basically, all right, here's the thing. Imagine you had like a, a limited, in a limited amount of time that you had, maybe let's say a few minutes, all right? You had the option to like say anything and leave a message or messages from yourself to anyone who might be listening to this podcast and they're kind of listening at this point like basically at any point of in at any point of time in the future you know and people who are listening to this podcast and they're here now is your chance this, this window of time like a time capsule basically to say anything like you're, <sighs> you're like living in like all outside holotape for people to later discover you know kind of like that 
<laughs> oh, well, you're gonna you're, you're gonna drop this on me now. <laughs> um, exactly. You know this. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty heavy. Um, wow, what were they saying? I mean, I think I would just say you know whatever whatever it is that you're doing, you know whether it's creative or not, just you know be brave enough to to take you know chances and you know um, people may not like you know who you are or what you're doing, but just go ahead and stick with it. And because, man, I tell you, uh, you, you, we don't get a lot of time on this this crazy planet. And, you know, you got to just you got to do what you what you like, do what you love. And, uh, you know, try not to, you know, try not to worry too much about what other people think. I know that's a tall order for a lot of young people, you know, because that's all that your life is about is being cool and, and worry about what other people think. Um, you know, I know for me in my art, it's like. Uh, oh, I got to make this thing a certain way or look a certain way because that's what's cool and that's what's expected. But if you, the most, uh, you know, engaging and the most sort of uh, amazing artists are the artists who kind of say, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to make this crazy wild thing because I want to make it. Not because, you know, uh, not because it's, it's what's in or what's now. And I guess, yeah, that's pretty much it. I would just say, you know, you have an infinite amount of power inside you and if you you know just do your best to not doubt that power um you know let it you know let it flow and just uh yeah i mean just do 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 what you want to do your time is limited enjoy yourself and take care you know your mind your body your spirit and uh i guess that's that's pretty much it you know All right, and well, I guess that's a wrap. That's the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for coming by. Where can people contact you if they had a question? Is there an Instagram account okay for that? Absolutely. Um, you can contact me on the Instagram or Twitter. My email is uh, darwinsellisart at gmail.com. It's basically the first, last name, and then art at gmail. Uh, and that's yeah, those are all sort of the avenues where you can get at me. All right. So again, thanks so much for coming by. It was a real blast, honestly. It was a fun episode. And thank you to anyone who tuned in and listened to this episode as well. If you had any questions or comments or critiques, you know, as always, you can shoot me a message or leave them down in the comments down below. Nothing less gets left unread. And with that being said, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Till next episode. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.